So it's come to my attention that YouTube won't recommend any of my videos that don't have a number in front of them. But since I'm in such a good mood, I came up with a great solution. I'm just gonna upload more. Stick with me there, I know that might be hard to believe, but I've decided that I'm just gonna vlog and also make stupid dumb list videos, so if you've been missing out on two months worth of my vlogs, make sure to click my channel page and catch up to the most eventful moment of my entire YouTube career. Anyways, there are more to come, including flame shooting Corvettes as well as bagging it and also building a weeb Miata. Make sure to hit that notification bell and make sure to keep up with the latest of my uploads and join the big brain vlog viewers and not the tiny gremlin list video viewers and blah blah blah, here's the stupid list video now. You wanna know the only thing that car guys love more than cars? It's constantly telling other car enthusiasts what to do with theirs, but in this video I'm gonna debunk some of the stupidest car enthusiast misconceptions about aerodynamics. For example, front wheel drive cars don't need wings. Alright, so front wheel drive cars, if you look at the shape of them, and you look at the shape of a rear wheel drive car, they're not magically exempt from the concept of aerodynamics. The way air flows around a vehicle is generally due to the shape of the vehicle. So if you have a car that's shaped similar to another car, whether it's front wheel drive or rear wheel drive, in the corners they both need downforce to grip. Now the main reason this stupid myth was created was due to drag racing as well as straight line street racing. Your average bone stock front wheel drive car on the road with like 180 horsepower will not need a spoiler or wing even if it has like 250 or 300 when going in a straight line because going in a straight line the average grocery getter usually makes enough traction as is due to their drivetrain setup and how weight shifts upon launch they don't squat nearly as much as rear wheel drive cars do and because their front wheels are the ones that are accelerating they don't have to worry about the front spinning out of control and fishtailing and leading into a fishtail essentially that's why a thousand horsepower integras even still only have a spoiler they still don't have a wing because they can go so ridiculously stable with the front wheel drive setup in a straight line. But again, back to track racing. Track racing does not discriminate against the drivetrain. Tra most of track racing and how air flows around your car is dependent around the shape, especially through the corners. What front wheel drive and rear wheel drive mostly will deal with is accelerating in and out of those corners and the one time you launch in the race, which is at the start, because when you launch from the pits, that's not a competitive launch, that's obviously a regulated launch, and you may not even launch at the start because so many races these days are rolling starts. But what I'm trying to say is that most of track racing is a battle of downforce, therefore front wheel drive cars still need downforce. We'll move on to another big misconception. Did you know that low speed racing also needs a ton of arrow, sometimes more arrow, due to all the consecutive turns? You go to Lanier Raceplex and they have like a 250 wheel horsepower, has a giant absolute trunk mounted wing, and people will look at them and be like, they don't need that. These guys don't need the wings. They only have they have less than 300 horsepower. It's not a matter of horsepower, it's a matter of application. So let's talk about something people are familiar with, track racing. If you had like a 250 horsepower car on like Road Atlanta, because let me do a size comparison. Here's Lanier Raceplex. Now let's scroll over and let's look at Road Atlanta. Yeah, Road Atlanta's huge. Because of how long and swooping the turns are there, yeah, you probably don't want a ton of downforce in a low horsepower car because your low horsepower car won't build enough speed in the straights to begin with to carry enough speed through the corners to warrant that big of a wing. So it's a lose-lose. You're losing speed in the corners and in the straights because of a giant wing that you don't actually need. However, when you're in a very tight-knit situation, even 60 can bring about a ton of g-force, especially when doing consecutive turns. Linking from one turn to another can constantly cause three-wheeling, or basically cause you to have one wheel peel off the ground and just spin out, and this happens a lot at the linear raceplex right after the slalom section, because that slalom, even though it's a low-speed slalom, is a lot more intense, and you only have a couple of meters of space to try to hit the right apex at the right speed with the right braking line, and if you don't do that, you spin out and unfortunately sometimes you even crash and I have literally footage of all this that you're watching that I actually took when I was there at that event. People need to realize that application matters. Surprisingly, if you're going slow with a slow horsepower car but in an intense situation, you actually do need more arrows. So next time you see like BRZs with wings, ask them what they use it for. If they say track racing, you know, what kind of track racing? If they're talking about autocrossing or tight knit super small courses, they're all the more need for them to have it. The next thing we'll talk about are roof spoilers. What I'm talking about right now is perhaps the riciest thing in the video, which is funny because a lot of people think roof spoilers are clean and tasteful because of how tiny and understated they are compared to big giant wings. So I'm gonna say this right now. If you have a hatchback, a wagon, a SUV, or a minivan, 
These are fine. Roof spoilers are perfectly functional on those cars, and that's because they're basically at the end of the vehicle, and because of how ridiculously slanted their windows are, basically like 70, 80, or even 90 degrees, those cars, their roof spoiler does the job. It is basically creating downforce and reducing lift at the absolute rear end of the vehicle. However, if you're putting a roof spoiler on a sedan, on a fastback coupe, or anything that has like a much more gently sloped window, like 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees, you really don't need a roof spoiler because your spoiler should be at the end of the vehicle and you also shouldn't be doubling up either. So here's a cool experiment done by Gray's Garage. I'll link to his video in the description. He tested out his side FRS, which which I'm sure some of you could even recreate the experiment. So he tried out clean, aka nothing at all. Then he tried out the OEM spoiler, and then he tried out a roof spoiler plus the OEM spoiler, and then he tried out a Rocket Bunny spoiler. The Rocket Bunny spoiler and OEM spoiler do their job of reducing lift, which is the whole point of what you would want on a rear wheel drive vehicle, especially when you're accelerating out of corners through the turns, or when you're just trying to launch in a straight line. The roof spoiler, however, fails to do this job. It actually generates more lift compared to even the OEM spoiler. The roof spoiler's positioning on a sedan or a fastback coupe basically just destroys the whole purpose of anything that comes after it, including the rest of your bodywork. So that's why it creates more lift. So your rear wheels are after that roof spoiler, and those are the wheels that you want to have lift reduced on. You want those to be pressed into the ground, but you're actually doing yourself far more worse of a favor for putting this on. So if you're someone who laughs at Rocket Bunny like, oh, Rocket Bunny spoilers are so rice. Well, joke's on you. Turns out they're actually the functional choice of this setup. Let this be a reminder that Mother Nature doesn't care about clean, cool, and understated design. It cares about freaking airflow and the way she invented it. And the way airflow is invented is that wings and spoilers on the back of your car is where they're supposed to be. So if you're on a hatchback, you can have a roof spoiler because that's the end of your guys' car. If you're on a sedan or if you're on a fastback, you should have a regular spoiler. The reason a lot of people put roof spoilers to begin with is for some reason they think they do the job of what vortex generators do. Now vortex generators are funny because these don't serve much, they're the exact opposite of a roof spoiler. They don't serve much function on an SUV, a minivan, or basically at the pure end of the vehicle. They serve a function on fastback vehicles, vehicles that have really long sloped rear windows because those rear windows create a lot of turbulence. So when you put vortex generators at the top of the roof before the rear window, that helps clear up the turbulence and you can see, here's just a brief test that I'm showing you on this screen of, that someone else did, I'll link to their video, of basically the air being turbulent and wiggling all the things around and then the air being straight and keeping all the strings straight. If you have a giant wing and you want to make sure the air is properly channeled to it, just get the right set of vortex generators. There's a reason why cars from factory like the Honda Civic Type R has them and even Mitsubishi Lancer Evolutions. Oh, and since I know someone's already gonna ask, but Bladed, what about roof spoilers with vortex generators? No, those don't solve anything. In fact, that just makes an already worse product even worse. And this is coming from a ricer. I'm just going to straight up admit to you guys. I mostly do things for looks, all right? But even as a ricer, I've got standards. Okay, so vortex generators are called vortex generators because they generate vortexes. So this is the shape of the wind that comes off of them. When that specific shape runs, immediately transitions from the top roof of your car down the shape of your rear window, that's extremely good. It contours the body lines, it flows with it, it's an attached flow, blah, blah, it's nice. What you're doing here is you're having the vortex generators still create vortexes, so they'll do their job, but because they're attached to this roof spoiler, you're kind of sending those vortexes away from your car, not attached flow. Yeah, no, these, these still don't solve the problem, the fundamental problem of roof spoilers. The final thing we'll cover are louvers. Now I talk about these a lot on my channel, but I'll finally talk about them from a performance standpoint. So a lot of companies have this really stupid marketing gimmick where they're like, buy louvers to improve airflow, buy louvers to improve aero over your rear window. No. So the reality is if you want to improve air over your rear window, get vortex generators. So that's a pure marketing gimmick. Never buy louvers for the sake of aero. The only reason you should buy them is because you don't want the sun in your car. You want privacy or you just like the way they look. On a quick note about louvers and roof spoilers, so louvers are not aggressively shaped, nor are they nearly as stiff as roof spoilers to function as spoilers, much less multiple spoilers. A lot of people have a fear that louvers will act as multiple window wings running down your rear window. They won't. The big difference is your roof spoiler 
is right on top of your roof, whereas the louver begins on your rear window. So that that's a huge difference because the air that's right on top of your car that goes over your roof is really important air. I wouldn't disturb it or mess with it too much. Once it gets past that point and has to run down your rear window, well, that's a trick question because most of the time it doesn't run down the rear window in the way you would think. Therefore, putting something there doesn't really change the overall result. So, Engineer Explain is a really cool video talking about McLarens and Porsche 918s and why they have their exhausts located where you would expect a rear window on a fastback vehicle. Now, the reason they're located there in layman's terms is just because the air there is super unimportant. It's just mostly turbulent. That is why Lamborghinis will have louvers there. And those are all supercars made by multi-million dollar companies that have very talented engineers. So trust me, if there's a reason why they're putting louvers, exhaust tips, and random things in that area of the car, it, then it's probably safe to say that that area of the car just isn't exactly the most important place to optimize, especially for a street car or even a high-end performance car. You get the point, all right? It's... Louvers are not nearly as bad as people think. They don't help your arrow. They definitely don't, but they don't hurt your arrow. They're just kind of there. So I hope this video helped you learn a new thing or two about aerodynamics. And like I said, I link to all the videos I referenced to in the description below. Again, make sure to check out my vlogs and other videos that I have been making. If you've been missing out on the Weeb Vet Boy, you've been missing out on much because that's going to be most of the content coming in the future. Until then, I will see you guys more frequently, hopefully as long as I'm willing to do this faster upload thing that I'm saying. Otherwise, thank you for watching and see y'all next time. Blade Angel out.